Hello and welcome to the Larry Arnn Show. That would be me, Larry Arnn, president of Hillsdale College. And today's a treat. My guest today is the very great international and widely selling author, Dean Kuntz. You're going to enjoy this. We start in a minute. It's no secret that Americans are more divided than ever. And it's not just over what policies will improve our great country. No, it's over whether America is great at all, whether America deserves our love. That's why Imprimus is so important. Imprimus looks at the issues of the day from a constitutional perspective, reminding citizens always of our great heritage of liberty. For more than 50 years, Imprimus has featured speeches from the smartest conservative thinkers and writers at Hillsdale events. These days, Hillsdale publishes people like Molly Hemingway, Andy Puzder, Harmeet Dillon, and Chris Rufo. Over 6.4 million American households and businesses receive Imprimus absolutely free. And I urge you to sign up for it today at no charge. To get your free lifetime subscription, go to Hillsdale. Dot edu slash lifetime right now. Or text the word Imprimus to 71844 and we'll send you a link to sign up for your free lifetime subscription. That's I-M-P-R-I-M-I-S to 71844. Welcome, Dean. How are you? I'm well, thanks for having me. So I will just introduce you by saying that uh, I've had the privilege of coming to know you, and I admire you very much. I have now read 13 of your novels. If the internet is to be believed, which it's not, but it's what we got, you've written more than 100, and they have sold, by one account, the conservative account, more than 450 million copies. Another says more than 500 million. That would be an average of about $5 million apiece. That's not bad. So you've written all those. And uh, I want to start with how you grew up, if you don't mind, a couple things about your life, and then I want to go into this writing, and I want to talk about one, two, three, four, five of your heroes in your novels and how you conceived them. So how did you grow up? Difficult. I, it was a difficult growing up. Uh, we were uh, the very definition of poverty. Uh, we lived in a, uh, a tar paper roof house with the probably measured somewhere around 400 to 500 square feet. It had been built by my grandfather, who was not good at construction. So it was not exactly a wonderful house. We didn't have indoor plumbing until I was 11. Uh, and then the indoor plumbing consisted of one very tiny bathroom and running water in the kitchen sink. Until then, the uh, kitchen sink had a pump, and you had to pump the handle to draw water for cooking or washing your hands there. And uh, I, I didn't quite know until I think teenage years that we were poor because uh, uh, we had relatives around. I was always a kid that was up for fun. And what was more disturbing was my dad, who was uh, a violent alcoholic. And when he didn't come home, that was the best part of the day, if he stayed out all night. Uh, and much later in life, when we took over supportive and Jervin and I, my wife and I, we were told that he was dying and had about a year to live. And we brought him to California because we had just escaped Pennsylvania, where he would knock on our door at night at two in the morning drunk. And we thought that won't be happening again. And then we had the opportunity, I would say, to move him to California. And we had to take it because if I had not taken care of him, it would have been doing to him what he did to me, and we couldn't have that. So we brought him to California, and uh, he didn't live a year. He lived 14 years, and it was quite an adventure. And he was eventually diagnosed as sociopathic on his second time into a psychiatric ward. And at that point, I, I understood my childhood, I think, for the first time, that it explained his behavior 
more than just being an alcoholic. Did you have siblings? No, I was the only child. Yeah, so you're bearing a burden for everybody. I will mention that my grandparents, especially the ones, well, both of them, I saw, you know, they had out, when I was a boy, they had outdoor toilets and a well to get water out of and a hand pump on the sink. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And uh, my parents said, yeah, you didn't grow up here. All that means to us is work. <laughs> you got to work all the time. Get water, get everything clean. Wood stove, yeah. Now, you went to school in the public schools, and you went to which college? I went to Shippensburg State College, which at that time was a teacher's college. It's grown to a, a much larger uh, facility now and deals with producing more than just school teachers. But it was the only thing I could afford. It was, this seems almost impossible, but the tuition was $500 a year. And I had to work my junior and senior years. And my mother worked in order we could scrape money together for that. And for, of course, the other expenses that come with it. So I went to a regular public school. They were different then than now, I firmly believe. And then to that teacher's college where I majored in English. So you had to make two discoveries. You had to discover that you liked to write and you had to discover that you could. Where, where, when did you discover those things? I would give a lot of credit to my high school English teacher, Winona Garbrick, who was a whack in World War II. Uh, she was about five foot one and a lovely person, but she was a great disciplinarian. And every kid in school was sort of, who, the ones who didn't get her were terrified of her. And she was my English teacher in ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And somewhere in ninth grade, she, I was a relatively shy kid. And she came to me and said, you have a storytelling ability, you have a writing ability. I see that in papers you produced. So I want you to make assignments to you that the rest of the class won't be doing. And I was so taken that somebody cared that much about me that I didn't see it as extra work. I did see it as an opportunity. And in those four years, she really brought me along and gave me confidence. And uh, she would let me do take a tape recorder and make a radio program with different acts on it that would all be me. And it was all comedy and stuff like that. Um, and I had a great time with it. When I was a senior, not to make this story too long, ours was a very large high school because they came from all over the county, all these little small towns, to this one school. And she uh, found out I was going to Shippensburg and that I was going to major in history. And during a change in classes, when the hallways were full of kids, uh, she came into all and saw me and she yelled, Coons! And she was so feared, in spite of being the sweetest woman, I've been, one of them I've ever known, the whole hall cleared, and it was like a Western movie. She came walking up the hall toward me, pointing at me, saying, you're going to Shippensburg. And I said, yes. And she said, and I hear, by the time she got close to me, she started tapping my forehead with her finger with each word. And I said, I hear you're majoring in history. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, do you know why you're majoring in history? And I said, I like history. And she said, no, it's because history is easy for you. And you're always going to do the easiest thing if you don't straighten up. And she <laughs> said, you, you have writing talent and you need to major in English. And I was so impressed that she cared that I changed my major. So she had a powerful impact on my life. You just uh, provoked a war between two of our largest departments, English and history. <laughs> <laughs> I, I once had Rush Limbaugh say to me, uh, I hear it's hard to get a four point at Hillsdale. And I said, almost impossible. And he said, why is it hard? Has everybody got to take chem chemistry and physics? And I said, everybody does. I said, yeah, but you know, English and the Constitution are hard. He said, they are. And I said, yeah. And he said, the Constitution? I said, you know, maybe you don't know as much about it as you think you do. But uh, 
The English department prides itself on giving bad grades. And uh, it's a rule that's a point of pride around here. So you did major in English. And did you have good teachers in college? I'm sorry to say not many. I had one, uh, Richard Forsyth, that was his name. And uh, he taught uh, short story and composition. And I had a class with that. We became friends uh, even when I was in college. But I did not get very good grades in college because I have to just bluntly say I didn't think much of the classes I was sitting in. And I was frustrated and it felt often like a waste of time. And uh, then when I was at the end of my junior year, one of my teachers submitted a story I'd written called The Kittens to uh, an Atlantic monthly competition for college writing. And that had been around for a long time. And teachers at Shippensburg had been sending stuff by their students to this competition for probably decades. And I didn't even know it had been submitted. And it turned out to win a prize in the competition. It was the first time that it happened for anyone at Shippensburg. And suddenly I discovered the glory of being accepted by somebody like the Atlantic Monthly at that time. It's a different magazine now. And uh, suddenly I could do no wrong in a class. I still was the same kind of unconvinced student in many of these classes. But suddenly I was getting all four-star ratings. Uh, and uh, <laughs> everything I did was acclaimed. And I said, hmm. And that was very appealing during my senior year. But I turned around and there was no money in the Atlantic Award. It was just a lovely certificate and a little booklet of all the things that had won. And I took that same story and sent it to a magazine that bought it for $50. Now, this was at a time when a paperback cost 50 or 60 cents. So to me, that was I could buy an awful lot of books with uh, that $50. But it also was the first time I realized, huh, people actually get paid to do this. I don't know why that hadn't impressed me before. But when the check was coming to me rather than to any of the writers of the time, Hemingway, for instance, it suddenly was real and more meaningful. And uh, I loved writing, but I hadn't thought of it as a way to make a living. But at that moment, I started to think of it as what I loved and what could actually be a living. And you became a writer as a career in what year, roughly? Uh, my first novel was published in 1968. But I had sold, I'd sold quite a, well, probably two dozen short stories by then. Did you marry Jerda in 1961? Did I read that? Uh, no, we were married in 1966. Six. So she had uh, years where she helped you build a career. Yes, she did. She, uh, when we were married in 66, I was working in the uh, Appalachian po Poverty Program and uh, it was my first year after uh, graduating college. And then I taught in a regular school district in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And I was writing every weekend, most evenings. And the short stories were selling and then paperback, a couple of paperback novels. But they weren't enough to earn a living. And she said to me one day, I know what you want to do. You want to write full time. So I will support you for five years. She was working in a credit department at the time. And uh, she said, I'll support you for five years. And if you can't make it in five years, you're never going to make it. And I sometimes say I tried to negotiate her up to seven, but she has Sicilian <laughs> blood. So she needs every <laughs> negotiation. But it took the five years. And then she was able to quit her job, which she also said was a mistake. When she worked for other people, it was just 40 hours a week. But once we started to have success, it was a lot longer work week. Uh, but it's been the two of us pulling this wagon ever since. And I, there's no way I would have gotten where I've gotten without her. I've seen you together, and it's, uh, I'm blessed with a good marriage, too. It's like one person. 
and uh, more than doubled. I want to talk about, I mean, first of all, this is, it is simply extraordinary that you've written so many and sold so many. And that's an amazing, you know, I can attest they're the ones I've read and that's a lot of them are carefully written. How do you do it? Describe the process. Well, first I'll say that you, I won't let you read some of the early books. <laughs> I was learning as I went. I was poor and trying to make a living, and I hadn't found my way yet. And I subsequently kept those out of print. It's, first of all, you have to love it. You have to love the process. There are writers that love having written, and then they love the publicity part, the book signings, all that. Uh, I enjoy meeting readers at book signings, though some of them lasted 10 hours and could be exhausting. But you never had anyone that come up to you and say, I hate what you do and spit on your shoes. It was always people who could, gave you support. Uh, but I never much loved the publicity angle of it. So I was the kind of writer who liked the writing, but not having written. And uh, that's a key to getting uh, quite a lot of work done. When I go in and sit down and it's going well, it's one of the greatest feelings. I've often said, and it sounds to some people ridiculous, but when it's going exceptionally well, it's eerie. You feel this is not coming from me. You feel at your best in touch with a higher power and feel that whatever is happening with you is coming through you from elsewhere. And that is the greatest feeling of all in the course of writing a novel. And then I was always a big reader. Jordan and I didn't have a TV set for 10 years. We couldn't afford one when we were first married. And then we didn't want one uh, because we would read every evening. And we would each read about 200 books a year. Uh, and it was that great volume of reading that I did in the first 30 years of my life that was one of the things that broke me through to finding my own voice. I have known writers who say they will not read other novelists while they're writing or while they're contemplating what they're going to write next because they're afraid the style of that of the, who they're reading will become an influence on them. And what I've always said is then read several hundred writers because they all will influence you, but you have influence coming from so many directions that none of them will dominate. And that's part of it. You mention other writers in your novels from time to time. Do you have favorites you'd mention now? Uh, yes. I tend not to mention living ones because I know some of them and I forget to mention their name. They get angry. But Dickens was a big influence on me. Uh, but before that was a writer named John D. MacDonald, who was a suspense novelist. And he he wrote a series character, but his best novels were novels set all over America in workplaces. He would write novels set in the real estate industry or the construction industry. And you knew he knew what he was talking about. Uh, and he captured a, a time in America in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I think that very few other writers ever captured as well. He had a profound effect on me. But there have been a great many writers that have. Uh, uh, sometimes because you think, okay, that's how not to do it. But uh, the better ones are the ones that uh, you, you just see something of yourself in the way they approach it. And, uh, and sometimes that helps you refine what you're doing. Uh, so I don't know how I could write without reading these days. I read so much research material. I don't get to read novels as much, but that had a profound effect and also motivated me. And as to why the number, I will point out uh, Henry James published 120 some books, so I still got a way to go. But yeah, yeah I think you'll get there. So uh, I, I mentioned that uh, I've loved Dickens all my life. In recent years, I've learned that G.K. Chesterton held him in the highest regard. Uh, did you know that? And do you read Chesterton? Yes, I do read Chesterton. In fact, Dickens' career 
they just, the respect for his work after his passing began to fade. And it seems odd now, but it was Chesterton who wrote about Dickens uh, that brought him back to consideration as a great writer. Uh, and it was reading about how Chesterton had helped rebuild Dickens's respect among critics uh, that got me to start reading Chesterton. And uh, I, th I think I just, I'm trying to think the, where I started, but I ended up reading almost all of Chesterton. So uh, you mentioned research. Your novels build the world. Uh, we're going to talk about some of your heroes and how they operate in that world, but you do seem to learn a lot about each world. I think you know quite a lot about digital surveillance, for example. <laughs> and, and, you know, if anybody's interested in evading it, there's some pointers <laughs> in the Jane Hawk series. <laughs> how do you learn that? What, what, how long does it take? How do you go about it? Now, after you've said that, there would be a knock on the door and there would be the FBI. But, <laughs> I just broke surveillance. <laughs> I broke cover. <laughs> Uh, the Jane Hawk series, I, I happened to read a couple of books, maybe three or four, in which the character was supposedly off the grid. And because I'm interested in a lot of things and in technology of all kinds as well, um, I knew I could have caught this character in about seven different ways. And it just frustrated me that you were supposed to believe this was a character off the grid. So... I thought, what if I wrote a character who desperately has to be off the grid because everybody's after her, and I know it should be a woman, and that she has the knowledge uh, to stay off the grid. And when the first couple of books came out, I had people call me who felt they were very knowledgeable about these areas and said, you know, that isn't true. She couldn't have done this or that the government doesn't do that. And it wasn't within two years or so of that that this stuff started to appear in newspapers. And it was one of the great pleasures of my life to say, I told you so. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it, I, I'm, very, I'm very small in that regard. And it, it was all out there to discover. And, but sometimes people don't want to know certain things I think, and they may suspect it's there to be discovered, but they'd rather not find out. And so at that became a real challenge in a five-book series because as I wrote the books, more and more things were occurring that I had to find out about. And when I found out, I, it was, I forget which book, that the government had on most of its vehicles and on police cars 360 degree spanning cameras that recorded all the license plates that that car passed. And all of this ended up in the in SI files. Uh, I thought, wow, her job of staying off the grid is getting harder and harder. Uh, so I don't think I could have written book six. I guess at this point, I think she couldn't have stayed off the grid. Hey there. Today, I want to tell you about the Hillsdale K-12 Classical Education Podcast. This unique show explains how children benefit from an American classical education. Whether you're a teacher, student, or parent, you'll find something of value on the show. You'll hear from teachers and administrators from schools around the country, as well as Hillsdale professors and friends who are leading the effort to revive the American tradition of K-12 education. When you listen, you'll learn all about classical education – what it is, how to teach it, and why it matters today. And there are dozens of back episodes on specific topics, like teaching Singapore math, reading great books, and even understanding how athletics is critical to a child's development. Listen every Monday on podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu, or wherever you find your audio. So I, I will tell you that uh, we're going to talk about five heroes, and the first is Jane Hawk because you brought her up, or I, maybe I did. But uh, Odd Thomas, uh, Tim Carrier, Mitch Rafferty, and I'm forgetting one of the names from, from the corner of his eye. 
whoever that guy is. So I'm going to encourage people to read these books because I, I will tell you, I saw the name. You may have my experience, people watching this. I travel more than I want to. And uh, there's a time at the end of a week when you're flying back and your brain is gone and you got a plane ride ahead of you and they sell books in airports. And so I have read a lot of books sold in airports. The best book I ever read sold in an airport that I bought in an airport was called Crossing the Threshold of Hope by John Paul II. But the typical one you've had there is not like that. And so in there you see Dean Koontz all over the place. And I could never figure you out. I'd pick one up and I'd, you know, and I'd wonder, what are these about? And they're not about any single thing. There are series, but and I was and I, I never did get a grip on it, and I never bought one. And then I found out more about you. So the Jane Hawk series, I will tell people, is about a bunch of people called the Arcadians who develop a way to put nanomites in people's brains and control them. And they have an idea for a perfect society of which, at which they will be at the top. And this heroic FBI agent, Jane Hawk, discovers this, a tragedy strikes her that they cause, and she goes to war with them. And it's very tense. And it's a little bit too much like reading the newspaper sometimes. I've found that I can't, I can't read them all consecutively. I have to take a break because they're too gripping, and they're great. So I'm interested in her. You said you knew she had to be a woman. How did you contrive her as a hero, and what are the features about her that seem most important to you? I knew it had to be a woman because I, I actually started the book just with the little scene where she's getting up and from sleep in a motel. and. I knew that I wanted her to have certain characteristics that are common to what you would think of as that kind of novel, that she was very attractive, that she was smart, but that underlying it all was uh, some other qualities uh, that you don't find so much in, well, I'm sorry to say, in a lot of contemporary fiction. Uh, she was going to be a person of of very hard-headed uh, sense of what is true and what isn't, uh, of recognizing lies, uh, of having no tolerance for them, of being someone who would only lie if she was lying to a liar. And it was what she had to do to get through this. I also wanted her to be somebody of great compassion, because that is kind of missing in a lot of contemporary popular fiction. I'm not saying this is a bad series, but when you think of Jack Reacher, you don't think of a character with great compassion. And I wanted her to, to be that kind of person. And then as I was writing the first couple of chapters, I thought there also has to be something at terrible risk that she uh, makes everything she's doing so urgent. And it occurred to me that she would have this very young child of five, and that all of these people looking for her are also looking for that child. And it's her job not just to destroy this group or to bring them to public attention, but to protect that child and hide that child. And, and how she thinks about the future of this country, and it's really what worries her most is what it will mean for that boy if she fails. And that's sort of how she grew as a character to me. And my editor at that time, after the second book, said, I just love the way she talks to the bad guys. And it, I just started to laugh because she is so utterly ruthless, not in what she does to them, but in how she talks to them, interrogates them, and treats them. And it is that she has absolutely no respect for them and no respect for the danger they pose to her. She's utterly fearless in her crusade. And uh, by the time all of those elements came together, and on some level below all that, she's very sure of herself. But on a level down lower, 
She's a very humble person. And that's something you never see anymore in so much of what I would call popular action figure. The heroes are give a lot of smart lines, but never do they stop to think about their true place in creation. And Jane does. So that's where she came. And when I had all of that, I thought, I just want to write more than one book about this person. And I never, I thought it was a trilogy, but I wasn't done in a trilogy. I still wanted to know more about her. Every book I wrote with her, I learned something more about her. And, uh, and that's the great thing about a character that works. They're never static. They just keep growing and changing. See, the, I'll say it to the reader, because I have read those now and uh, survived them <laughs> 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 to, to, a, to a happy conclusion. But, like, Jack Reacher is a good guy, and you couldn't read the novels if he weren't. But it's not, like... It's it's not explicit that he's acting for love and that his fierceness proceeds from love. But of course, for fierceness to be good, it would have to proceed from love. Indeed, there's an argument in Aristotle I regard as true that even very bad people have to be confused about that in order for them to be effective. So... What I congratulate you about her is, first of all, a sense of what's going on in the world, that people might become victims of technology and those who willed it, and it might be more comprehensive than any ancient tyranny. But the second thing is, you're explaining people to people, you're giving them an example and explaining, because you do that in the novel, what moves the best actions. There's a sort of moral instruction underway through those things. And uh, I congratulate you on that. It's the reason I managed to persist, although they troubled me. <laughs> it, it, uh, <laughs> good job. I want to talk about Odd Thomas. Uh, there are eight of those, right? I think there are. Yes. And, and I've read eight of them. I read them. And uh, those are good, too. And they're weird. <laughs> There's a, there's a fair amount of weird in Dean Koontz. Weird is in the political con, 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 currency of this very day. But uh, he sees the dead, and he can talk to them, and they can't talk to him, but they can react. How do you think of that? It's, uh, you know, I have him say something in the, in the first book, I loved the movie, The Sixth Sense. I, th I thought it was such a well-constructed film. And, of course, the line was, I see dead people. And Odd Thomas, I think it's in the first book, says, I see dead people, but then, damn it, I do something about it. And <laughs> Odd is, <laughs> he's driven by, he's driven by, well, I knew in the first book, oh, and my publisher at that time just, he wouldn't talk to me about Odd Thomas because he despised the book so much and thought the public would hate it. And then when the reviews were almost all very good and book sales were very, very strong, he very reluctantly said, I'll let you write more of them, but you have to write another book between each one. But I, what I knew in the first book about Odd Thomas it was the thing that intrigued me about writing such a series. I knew all the ghosts and uh, everything, all of those trappings, while fun, were not really what the books were about. The books were about a very good human being, a very moral human being, who is also quite humble, except he's on a journey to absolute humility. Uh, and that's where he's going to end up at the end of the book, uh, of the series. And I didn't really realize it would be eight books. I thought maybe three or four. And then when I was explaining this to Jerda one night, she said, so you're going to write a book about a character who achieves absolute humility without even really trying. And I said, yes. And she said, how do you know what absolute humility is like? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> 
I said, you're absolutely right. I have no idea. Uh, but I think the character will show me by the time we get there. And I don't know if I quite achieve what I wanted, but he is a character who is full of self-sacrifice. I mean, he, he will give himself for somebody else uh, quite easily and quite nobly. And he does so. And he does it with such a sense of humor about the world and himself and other people that I just had great joy when I read those books. He, he loves his profession. Uh, tell people what that is. He's a fry cook. <laughs> He's a fry. <laughs> He's a, that was something that drove my uh, publisher crazy. You can't have an action hero who's a fry cook. And... Uh, <laughs> But he's a very good fry cook, and he he likes uh, he likes doing it because it gives people something that makes their day happy if they have a good breakfast. Uh, and and he's uh, he he always was surprising me, and uh, and that's what makes a character some one of the ones you want to return to. And uh, he he's uh, he's quite a piece of work, God Thomas. He's in these uh, incredible crises. And he does behave consistently nobly, and yet doesn't get a big opinion of himself. I mean, it's very, very good. But there's a book because I've I've had the vice of motorcycle riding in my in my life, and everybody who does that knows the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and it has long passages about how cool it is to ride a, the experience of riding a motorcycle. Odd Thomas makes me want to be a fry cook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you know he'll be in some incredible thing, and he'll miss his spatula. <laughs> it's a, it is weird, but good. And somebody's asking me yesterday. Uh, I said, uh, "See, I think Dean Koontz. Uh, I'll put this proposition to you. I've got a couple more to put. I think that you're showing us how to look for the hero in all of us." And your heroes tend to be ordinary, except underneath they have reserves. And I think you like the emergence of those reserves. Would that be true? That's yes, that's true. I, uh, you know, people think, especially after you're a number one on the bestseller list for a number of times, they they make the assumption that you're good buddies with all kinds of stars in Hollywood, <laughs> and people that are famous in various fields. And I have to disabuse them of that. Uh, my friends are in the construction trades or they're in the restaurant business or they're in this or that. I find those people more interesting, actually, and uh, and we have more in common. I'm trying to think now if I'm on the track of answering the question. But yes, it's because I, I've seen people that uh, in in our culture would be called ordinary or uh, would be called even worse things than ordinary in our politicized times, who, as much as anyone uh, at crisis in their lives, uh, step up and take care of things. And it's uh, it's what I wanted to show. Uh, and once I got a handle on that, I wanted that to be something that these books were all about. It's... Uh, I don't say this in a preachy way uh, because that would be something that would turn a reader off. But I do want to show how to live, uh, that you're going to be happier uh, than some of the choices that people make today. And sometimes living lower a key than all those flashy parties and other things is the way happiness is really found. And that's why... Uh, you mentioned Timothy Perry, or he's a he's a ma mason, and uh, uh, there's a character in Velocity as a bartender, and they get caught up in these things, and uh, and they turn out to have what's necessary to take care of the situation, and they have the courage to do it, and that's what I've seen about so many people, and I think was what has always been so great about America, and it's one of the things I'm afraid we're losing. I've uh, studied a lot, and I've been privileged to know some very famous statesmen. 
And uh, I, didn't, I never knew Winston Churchill, but I knew I know a lot about him. And something in common of all the ones I admire uh, is they liked regular people, and they expected a lot from them and thought they could. Winston Churchill, you know, the eldest son of the second son of a duke, and he, he, he always thought the British people are the ultimate reserve. And... Uh, so as not to, to, to contribute to the overall politicalization of the culture right now, there's a contemporary politician. And anytime he's around a bunch of people, he gravitates to the workers. And Lincoln did that and was a worker himself. So I, I think that's right. I think that this idea that we should get to govern ourselves depends upon a doctrine in Aristotle, and that, that doctrine begins his Nick McKean ethics that everybody wants the good. Everybody does. And in the right system, uh, unless they're prevented, most people will mostly do it. And uh, that's, so th that's on display in your novels. And uh, very often there are the evil people hold the ordinary people in contempt. They think they're sheep. They think they can prey on them. They even, in Jane Hawk's series, persuade themselves that it's their duty to do that. Because to perfect the world, they have to place themselves at the top of it. And everybody else has to be in service to them. Because they're not competent, see. Well, your novels are full of competent people who are surprisingly so. And I think that's uh, deliberate. Tim Carrier is the bricklayer, right? And uh, Mitch Rafferty, what does he do? I'm forgetting right now. Uh, you know, I'm forgetting uh, Mitch Rafferty. What book was that? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll uh, tell you. I, I I looked it up. I've read these books. Tim Carrier is a stonemason. Mitch Rafferty is the husband. And uh, oh yes, yes, okay. He's a landscaper. <laughs> you know landscapers, yes. and you know fry cooks, and you know stonemasons. <laughs> Because you built houses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you go to restaurants. <laughs> You're dealing with the professions you know here. <laughs> and uh, these guys find, uh, like, Tim Carrier is much more than a stonemason. He's uh, trained. And uh, that emerges. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I made notes. Because I knew I was going to talk to you. I, I read these things for pleasure, by the way. And I, I will re I recommend to people, uh, you know, I teach Aristotle and I know a lot about and Winston Churchill and America and various things around here. And I, I, re I teach a course on totalitarian novels. We're about to do an online course on it. And I warn everybody that I started reading those novels for the predictions they hold at the course of things. But now when you read them, it's a little bit like reading the Jane Hawk series. Some of this stuff is going on, in my opinion. And uh, so that's kind of grim. But I turn to Dean Koontz, or, uh, yeah, I turn, to, I turn to you because it is diverting. I mean, Jane Hawk is not sufficiently diverting because it's a little bit too topical. But watch, read the books and watch the series. But it's diverting and it's serious, and it's good. And I don't know anybody else who achieves that on the scale. I mean, first of all, is there anybody else who's alive who sold as many books as you have? I don't think so. I don't track other people's sales, really, but I'm sure there's some, some close or, or maybe somebody I had. I don't know. I don't see it as a... I'll stay away from that because... I don't see writing as a competition, but I've learned that there are writers who do, and uh, envy gets in the way. So I stay away from comparisons. Yeah. So it, it, but it makes my point because you're up there with the most, and the books are good for one to read. That's my point. And, and you've said in this discussion that you intend for them to be. And that's... Uh, that's this question of the good and the transcendent. You you thought about that a lot. Have a faith of your own, right? And you uh, 
want people to see that that can operate in the world and put it in motion in fiction. Is that fair? Yes. I've written in a number of novels. Uh, I, I sort of sneak it in. I, I uh, contemporary, well, not contemporary, but because it began a long time ago, but the whole field of quantum mechanics and the physics associated in that area. Really, and I know a number of uh, physicists in that area who will not necessarily publicly say this, but it does reveal to them that we're living in a created world. And that's something that can ruin your career in some of Mm. these sciences if you dare to say, look at what this shows us. Well, for a novelist, uh, I've written a couple of books in which are several, in which I use those elements in science uh, that do show us there's purpose and meaning in the world, that everything is not just random. And I'm always looking for a way not to preach, but to maybe show people something they've never encountered before or never thought about before. And how it can bring you to a moment uh, where you say, wait a minute, uh, now that I know that, now that I've thought about that, I start to bring it into my own life and it opens you up, I think, to seeing aspects of life that you had just blinded yourself to that bring you toward an understanding of the world as a place of meaning and purpose and therefore your life has no meaning and purpose. Too many people today sort of given up on the thought that that is true. Uh, so I want that to be part of what these books say. I don't know if that answered your question. But <laughs> it does. And and uh, it brings me to the next one, which is uh, you go about that purpose in a heck of a way because there's great tension and suspense and difficulty and despair. So you raise up an enormous obstacle, you know, because it looks like everything's going to go to pot. And so that's a dramatic possibility that must be very difficult to achieve because if you're trying to show good, it's harder but more vivid, I think, if you raise up evil to a great height. And how do you do that? Do you agree with that? And how do you do it? Uh, yeah, I do agree. I want the, uh, the evil in it not to be... Uh, I don't write the kind of evil that is... Uh, I don't go in for really gory violence or anything like that. Uh, but it's the intention of the people, it's, it, it almost always comes down to one thing. Evil is a desire for power over others. How that power, what power the evil person wants, it may be as simple as the power in one relationship, or it may be as in the Jane Hawk series, power over all of civilization. Uh, and that And you also have to believe, to write well, I think, about evil, you have to believe it exists. Too many people today don't see evil as anything other than something that needs the attention of a psychiatrist uh, or a psychologist or a therapist of one kind or another. But that isn't going to deal with evil. And so you have to believe the evil is true. It's real on our world. And that there are even when you have no supernatural in the story, I think it's important to imply within the story that there is the evil of humanity. Uh, uh, the human heart is above all else deceitful, and therefore evil exists with potential for evil exists within us. But you also have to sort of imply that there is that evil that. Uh, uh, bears a name and uh, it exists in an entity uh, and is supernatural. And you don't have to have that in the story. It can be done subtly uh, within it that you're speaking almost to the unconscious by saying 
about this character that there is something more about him than what you've seen. There is some force behind him that uh, that supports him. And just don't bring up the all of the the supernatural or the spiritual element of it, but you have to know it's there. And then I'm always afraid that the evil character is so compellingly glamorous that uh, they become the wrong kind of role model because I've seen that happen in so much popular entertainment where a character who is just despicable becomes admired and emulated, and that's the last thing I want to see happen. So I develop a technique that I use in virtually almost every novel. The evil character is unconsciously funny. He doesn't know he's a comic figure, but he is. He's a fool because evil only works in the short run. You can succeed by ill methods, but sooner or later, they'll blow up in your face. And so it is not the way to live a full life with uh, with a relaxed heart. And that's something I learned from my father. He would do, cheat people and steal from them. And uh, it would work well for a while, but it would always suddenly, somebody was just trying to put him in jail. So if you can laugh at that evil character at moments because of the level of their foolishness that they don't see, then it takes that glamorous edge off them and uh, and they seem to me in that way even more fully evil. I don't. There's a lot to it uh, of writing about evil, so that it doesn't start entering your own spirit. It's a deduction in or an argument in classical philosophy that uh, evil actually doesn't have any independent existence. It's a good thing spoiled, and uh, it doesn't have being. Uh, a bad thing doesn't have being. And so that super uh, natural being to whom you refer, that's a good thing spoiled, the best thing spoiled. Uh, now, I want to close. Thank you for doing this, by the way. It's delightful. I want to close by enrolling a third department in the war that you provoked. Philosophy has to say that poetry is superior to history, uh, Aristotle says this, as, as a, a means of understanding the world, because uh, history tells us what we know of the world. We only really know the past. The present is fleeting and the future is not here. But a poet can build a world and he can make it perfect from the point of view of understanding. But the world has to be a representation of the real world, too. Do you agree with that? Does that make sense to you? Yes, makes total sense. Uh, and uh, I will say probably my favorite poet is T.S. Eliot. Uh, and in a line, he can give you uh, enough uh, of a view of the world you haven't thought of uh, that occupies you for hours. And uh, that, that I think is adjacent to the point you're making. It's sometimes the fewer words that bring you the essence of something. And that's a great strength of poetry. Yeah, you, you, so uh, you, you have a tremendous, uh, and I don't, by the way, I, I, this morning I was on the phone with uh, their off at a retreat, that a bunch of student leaders, school starts next week, I always talk to them the week before. I was on the phone with them for two hours on a big Zoom call, about 40 of them, I think. And I discouraged them from uh, thinking of themselves as creative, because they're here to discover. But this creative ability that you have, and I think you really do have it, I mean, you've built more alternative worlds than anybody living I know. That is built upon an act of discovery. And uh, that's why your fiction is good for a person to read. They will learn and it will make them better. So I thank you for that. And uh, I'm so proud to know you. 
Well, thank you. I'm very honored to be associated with Hillsdale in, in any way whatsoever. I think it's a wonderful institution, and I hope we get to see each other quite often over the years to come. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, big question. I think we're doing this podcast because you might have just finished a book. Is that true? I wish it were finished. It's about 30 or 40 pages from the end. It's been a very tough book because I've never written anything remotely like it. And then it's it's written as a memoir by a very oh. unusual person. And uh, it's it's uh, it begins in the 1930s and ends in 1943. Uh, so there's been a great deal of research in it. But I, I wanted to have a character who the world has treated terribly and uh, and in the most miraculous way it gets taken into a family that seems like the ideal family in the world and that this this person who is basically a carnival freak uh, in a time when that was a big deal in carnivals they uh, they had what they called ten in ones where there were ten uh, human oddities within them and this this I won't go into how the story works, but this character gets pulled out of that life into a life that is totally at the, almost the top of the scale, and, and and it seems like this family has has given this character so much. But well, I'm going to give it away. The character, the character gives them more than they give the character, and. Uh, it's, it's I'm I'm in love with it. <laughs> so my reaction to that is my reaction to all your books. Great. And how in the world did you ever think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I said to you with that ideas ideas come and sometimes you know not from where. You just look up and say thank you. Awesome. Good. Thank you. I look forward to the book and more books. I got a lot of reading to do. And uh thank you, Dean, and say hello to your wife and your dog. Take care. You say hello to Penny and your dogs, too. <laughs>